Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of sprints by Jake Knapp. How to solve big problems and test new ideas in just five days. He had a few other little Sanders little helpers helping him out with this one. Uh, John Zoratsky and Braden Kowitz. So, uh, sprint. Hey. Buzzword. Something I... Um you know, something that popped up from time to time. I didn't really know what anyone was talking about. I thought it just meant go really fast on something. Uh, but there's this very specific process as to how to do a sprint. It is, and uh, it all came from from this guy, uh, who were the author of this book today, Jake, and um, and it did stem from his days at Google, right? Google Ventures, mm-hmm. and then you know, all the a few years later, it is a bit of a buzzword. Yeah. I've heard about four times in the last couple of months. <laughs> just... um, getting a bit over the word. <laughs> But there's a lot in the book and there's a good reason for it. Yeah. I think for a very specific purpose, this is phenomenal. And this book is almost like the textbook of exactly how to do it. I think some people have taken their own ideas and kind of morphed it. And sometimes the sprint you're thinking might not be the actual sprint and people just claim that it is. But Mm. uh, but yeah, anyway. Good good way to make money off (laughs) clients. But a bit of Jake's story, right? So, Jake, he had his first kid. Then he went back to work and he only found that uh, he wasn't spending his time in the best possible way in that he wasn't doing his most important work. So, he started optimizing, reading books like we all do on time management, making spreadsheets, tracking efficiency and trying to uh, experiment with a lot of things to improve this area of his life. That's right. Then he got a job at Google. So, he was pretty happy with himself there and he thought, I'm going to help other people. You know, all these things that I've learned, I'm going to help uh, the whole team to be more efficient. And so his first thing was bringing in these group brainstorms with his team of engineers. And it feels like a lot of fun, you know, everyone's shouting out ideas. And then after now, you've got this big pile of sticky notes uh, because there's like, you know, you've come up with such great stuff or so it might seem. Because one day, a particularly disagreeable sort of introverted engineer was like, how do you even know these group brainstorms are working? He's like, well, we get so many ideas out of them. But then when he actually took a step back, he realized that the good ideas were the ones that when people went away afterwards. So they had the brainstorm. It seemed like there was a bunch of ideas, but they all sucked. It was yeah. later on when people started just, they're at their desk or they're in the shower or whatever they were doing, they just like an idea came to them later and they're like, there was a much better idea than the group brainstorm idea. Yeah, well, that's usually, if you think about your own ideas when they come to you, it's very rarely in a meeting context mm. like that, isn't it? And you're probably going to get the big alpha, just um, you're screaming out their ideas, who's going to, probably get their point made more so than everybody else. So, when he looked at the, this sort of method he used to do, he found it was completely useless really and he realized that the results come uh, in different ways and this is where he uh, came up with new methods of the brainstorming and also product delivery. One example was when they were at, uh, he was at Google and then he was working with the Gmail team and they wanted to make this priority inbox, you know, how they, they split off now. You get most emails come in one place, but sometimes you miss emails because they go somewhere else. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was these guys. They worked out how to do it and uh, their boss, she said, okay, you've got this idea, but you've got four weeks to do it. Now, we can possibly no way we can do this in, in four weeks, but she was like, well, you've either got four weeks or you're not doing it. And so they said, okay, well, I guess we'll see how we go. They kind of broke it down into into chunks and just worked through it. And amazingly, they got through it in those four weeks. Another example is when Jake was visiting colleagues in Sweden, he found that they were using different um, meeting software than other people were. And when he asked actually what it was, they said they built it themselves. And they wanted to build out a video meeting software that didn't need an app to run but could operate directly in the browser. And they only had one week in Sweden this time, right, which is pretty wild. So they had to finish the prototype before they left. So you're really putting the the pressure on here for one week to build something as wild as that. And it turns out it worked out pretty well because that became Google Hangouts, which is now Google Meet, which is something I use almost every day. And obviously, they've done well from that one week uh, it wasn't a sprint then, but they basically they, they sprinted. But what was kind of amazing about both of these two major changes that came out of Google was firstly, there was time to develop their ideas independently. It wasn't out of uh, shouting matches in the brainstorm, but also there wasn't too much time because they had this really tight deadline where you had to get it done in a certain time or not done at all. And it meant that they didn't get caught in the weeds. They didn't overanalyze every detail. They made decisions quickly and then they just got to work. Yeah, a bit of Parkinson's law there, isn't it? When you've got the, the amount of time you give to do a task, the task will just fill up the amount of time you give it to it. So here you're trying to um, <laughs> compress that chamber as much as possible. But the second point here is the people, the engineers, the product managers, the designers, everyone's in the room together working on their part of the problem as they see it and they're 
also in the room to help answer each other's questions because a lot of these things that are complex, they do require some multidisciplinary collaboration to get to the end. So big Jakey here, he took all these different elements, the focused individual work, the prototyping stage, the inescapable deadlines. He morphed this into what he calls the sprint. And then he led sprints for Chrome, Google Search, Gmail, all these internal projects. He eventually ran sprints for Google Ads, Google X, Google Ventures. And then the CEO of Google Ventures was so impressed. He was like, man, this we're getting some great results from doing all this stuff. Uh, can we use it for some of the startups we're investing in? So all of a sudden, these things that he'd been doing internally for Google, he started doing for all of the startups because they realized for startups... You know, you need to achieve results pretty quickly. You don't want to stuff around. You don't want to waste too much time or money. And the sprint, this five-day process, seemed like the perfect way to get results quickly. And the five-day process works for all kinds of uh, customers, from investors to farmers, oncologists to cafes, websites, iPhone apps, paper medical reports, high-tech hardware, probably the stuff everyone's listening, whoever's listening right now, there's probably something you could apply a sprint to according to old, old Jakey boy because sprints, they offer a path to solve all the big problems, test new ideas, get more done, but best of all, do it really fast and do it in one week and you can also have a lot of fun along the way. Yeah, definitely. So, what is a sprint after we've been saying all these things? A sprint, it's this Google's unique five-day process for answering some of the tough questions, prototyping, testing ideas with customers. It says it's basically a greatest hits of business strategy, innovation, behavioral science, design, all rolled into one in this packaged up step-by-step process uh, where it's like a, a pretty nicely regimented day-by-day, here's what you do and by the end of the week, you've got to win. So rolling in on Monday here. <laughs> Monday makes me think of uh, your dinner party the other night, Tom Katz. Very <laughs> funny comment. It's one of those things I, I laugh at a few times a week when he said, oh, what did he say? <laughs> well, it was a Sunday night dinner party and he said, oh, better head off. It's Monday tomorrow, yeah? But no, he said, oh, it's a bloody Monday. Uh, <laughs> I hate I hate having to work Mondays to start the week. And his, his partner goes, mate, you got a you you day off tomorrow. You, you don't have a job. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but for most of us, we, we all have different Mondays, but it's a different Monday today because we're rolling in. It's going to be day one of a sprint and we're going to make oh, yeah. some big, big progress towards our goals today. On a Monday, we, we start at the end, we make a bit of a map, we ask the experts, we pick a target. It's a big day, big day Monday. There's a lot going on. Uh, it starts off with a little story here. The Apollo 13 astronauts are headed to the moon, but there was an explosion on board the spacecraft. Now, the people on board, understandably, would have been shitting bricks. You know, they're, they're wondering what's going to happen. Are they going to crash back down to Earth? Are they going to get sent off to Pluto? What's going on here? You've seen uh, that George Clooney film. They've seen that. They're thinking we're going <laughs> to... Gravity never ends well, that, those sort of situations <laughs> almost, in movies. Almost never ends well, that's for sure. Um, the explosion had blown up the air filter as well, which meant the only air they had left was the air that was left in their tanks on their suit because after that, they were going to suffocate. The explosion had sent them off course. They didn't know if they were heading to the moon or somewhere else. And so everyone was understandably pretty panicked. Yeah, and now it was on mission control really to get them back to the Earth safely. And that was the overarching goal, obviously, to get this. And they needed to keep them on the right course every minute of the journey. Also, keep the astronauts alive long enough and because uh, it was going to be at least a two-day trip to get around the moon and back. So, in terms of the hierarchy, what they needed to do, firstly, they needed to, to correct the ship's trajectory so, to ensure it won't veer into deep space or the other way and be like George Clooney. Secondly, they needed to replace the failing air filter just so the astronauts could breathe and only then they could turn their attention to safely landing. That's right. So they've got their very clear hierarchy here because if they had have gone, oh my goodness, these guys, they've blown up. How do we get them to land safely? And they're thinking, oh, do we have a big pillow that they land on? <laughs> do we send them into the water? Do we, uh, I don't know, sh- shoot it down? Like wh- how can we, what can we do? If they spend all this time thinking about the third goal, all of a sudden they're out, they're heading towards the sun and they're going to blow up anyway. So you've got to go, obviously, you know, as uh, Covey would say, first things first. You've got to, uh, correct the ship's trajectory before you start looking at the safe landing. Yeah, if you just spring into the action and start solving problems, you're probably going to start worrying about the wrong thing and not prioritize correctly and have your first things first. So, what we're doing today at the start of any journey in completing a project, of course, it is prioritizing about, hey, what are we going to be trying to solve here exactly? And this is all about setting the long-term goal. 
you're probably thinking, oh man, we're doing this five-day sprint. We've only got five days to come up with our prototype and test it. Why are we wasting time talking and planning and thinking, let's just get straight into action and start building? But as you say, you'll start building the wrong thing. That so, is the bias, isn't it? You <laughs> big, just want to get time. into it. You just want to get stuck in and you're probably a bit frustrated. Oh, well, we have to sit here and plan now. But uh, the important thing to start off is why are we doing this project in the first place like what are we here to achieve you know where where do we want to be six months from now a year from now five years from now this discussion it could be 30 seconds if everyone's on the same page it could be 30 minutes if there's a whole bunch of competing ideas yeah you get to think about your team's principles and aspirations what are the what are you here for what are your values you're really starting at the hundred thousand foot level here and you need to settle on a big long-term goal or as jimmy collins would say it have it hairy and audacious also <laughs> write it at the top of the whiteboard and this is going to be staying there throughout the next five days uh, as our beacon of light just to remind everyone what we're trying to do here and what is our utmost objective. That's right. You might have uh, the BHAG, you might have your, you want to become a unicorn, you want to become, you know, valued a billion dollars or you you might want to have, you know, 50,000 new customers or you might want to have whatever it is. Uh, It's good to go, you know, a little bit wild, a little bit optimistic. You got to get a a little bit of pessimism in there as well, though. You've got to think about what could go wrong. What are the things that if it doesn't work, if we have an explosion and our space rocket starts veering off course, what were probably the things that, that cause that and what's kind of lurking beneath the surface, these sort of unmentioned assumptions that, that could cook us? So I guess that's the, the, the big why we're throwing up on the board, isn't it? The next mm. thing we're going to solve is the who. Who do you want in the room? Because some people are going to be lead weights, some people are going to, not going to be the right people in the room or you might have a bias to actually just choose everyone who's got the same ideas or same sort of mindset as you. But if you think of like a good movie where uh, there was a big goal which they needed to assemble a team, one that comes to mind to the author is Ocean's Eleven where in the movie you've got a band of career criminals um, and for a once-in-a-lifetime heist. And uh, how's the diversity you've got to achieve that one? You've got that little bloke, that tiny bloke, I remember, who fits in the little safe. <laughs> you got from him to George to... Who, I don't remember Brad who Pitt's else. in it. Brad Pitt's in it. He's doing something else. Cast. They're yeah. all quite different, aren't they? You've got the pickpocket. You've got the explosive guy. You've got the acrobat. You've got all yeah. these sorts of weird skills that... You're like, how, how are these possibly related don't you just need you know some big tough guys to just storm past the guards knock them out and then grab the money and run but no there's a lot more that goes into it so you need to have that right mix of talent and experience and ideas yeah throughout your team you're going to have knowledge widely distributed about how to solve this challenge somebody for example knows about your customers someone knows about their technology someone knows about the marketing the business and so on and then somewhere in the mix you've probably got the one who's making the call and is the actual (laughs) decider uh, if you need to, to make a decision. That's right. So when you're assembling your, your sprint team, you need to think about all these kinds of things. You need to bring in the right different people with the right diverse perspectives from all different places of the of the business and the challenge and the thing that you're trying to build because uh, by having all those different ideas, you're, you're not going to end up building the wrong thing. You're going to get the right mix that's going to serve the business objectives most thoroughly. Okay, so there's a few act- activities to do on the Monday but at the end of the day what we've got we've got the right people in the room we've prioritized what our long-term objective is of the week and of course you've got you've allocated who is the decider who's going to be making the calls along the way and these are really with these three mixed together we can start moving on to day two which is Tuesday. That's right. Now that we've got our goal locked in, now it's time to think about some solutions. We're, pro- we're still not at the build stage yet, so maybe there's someone in the corner a bit restless, ready to get their fingers uh, to done, work and start coding. we at this stage, haven't we? <laughs> That's we're just right. just what, a lot of talking, and uh, there's going to be a lot more talking. There's still ideas. So Monday was all about picking the challenge and choosing the target. Tuesday is about coming up with ideas and solutions. So let's imagine it's the early 1900s. And you want to have a nice cup of coffee, only it's not so nice. Back then, the coffee really sucked. It gets stuck in your teeth. The liquid is bitter. It makes you want to puke. But if you want for the caffeine that gives you that little drug hit, you probably wouldn't even bother. Back in the day, coffee was brewed like tea. It had like a little pouch of ground beans that you dunked into boiling water. But there was plenty of room for error. There was overbrewing, underbrewing, and a whole bunch of grit and shit that gets to the bottom of the cup that you got to try to dodge. Uh, and then some people tried to like filter with, with cloth, but it just was pretty messy. It went everywhere. Until 1908, a German woman named Melita Bentz, uh, she got fed up with this gritty, bitter coffee, and she thought, there's got to be a better way. So she was inspired, actually, by seeing her son using blotting paper to mop excess ink 
uh, on his schoolwork. So she took a sheet of the blotting, the same idea, paper, punched holes in the bottom of a brass pot with a nail, placed the pot over a cup with a blotting paper inside, filled it with ground coffee, and whoosh, <laughs> and she added hot water. And all of a sudden, we've got uh, the paper coffee filter, right? There you go. Sounds a lot like um, Nike. What's his name? Bill Bill Bowman. You know, saw mm. someone playing with the waffles mm. who uh, to, to make the first shoe. So, that's really a lot of the time how inspiration does strike. It comes from combining different random ideas that come from different parts of the world and add them together. Uh, we, and we read a lot about that specific thing in the uh, Medici effect, right? Yeah. We normally think that ideas, you've got to come up with something brand new out of nowhere. But as the Medici effect would say, and as, it, as clearly this uh, 1908 German lady found out as well, it's not necessarily about coming up with something brand new. It's probably bring a bunch of different existing ideas, repurposing them with the right vision, with a, with a different purpose, and uh, you end up with something pretty, it seems magical, even though you just probably borrowed a couple of different things from a couple of different areas. So day two, we want to be combining existing ideas in different ways as much as we can. And the way to facilitate that within the Ocean's Eleven group that we've got together is through what they call lightning demos. Now, this is the sprint method for collecting and synthesizing a lot of ideas where people are given turns in taking three-minute tours of what their personal favorite solutions might be. Yeah, they come across from all uh, different domains. It doesn't have to be anything related to your thing. It might be, I really love how this app works. I really love how this website works. I really love how I, I called up a shop the other day and this was a process they took me through. It could be anything. And what we're trying to do here, we're not just trying to rip it, but we're trying to take some raw materials, you know, like trying to take a bit of blotting paper, trying to take a can with a nail and bank some holes in it like uh, Melita Benz did. We're, we're trying to find these raw materials that we might get one little bit from here, one little bit from there, and we end up with something brand new at the end. I like it, Ash. So each person in the room brainstorms a list of potential solutions for what their problems might be, and you're encouraging them to get outside of their comfortable realm. I'm sure there's going to be a few that flop. Asha, you've been on a few sprints. Mm. What's the ratio, mate? Is there been <laughs> any that have just fully flopped and you're just embarrassed or is it sort of a culture where mm. dumb ideas are embraced or, or behind the scenes, everyone's like, oh, shit, Johnny came up with that. <laughs> Get rid of jo Johnny's losing his job next week after this week. There's there's some there's some flops that's for sure. <laughs> there's some flops. Well, I think there is. I think the the overarching method uh, is a good one. It's a good one. I, uh, you don't want to go too close to your existing realm because then you end up just stealing other people's stuff. But you also can go too wild. Like he says, go go wide, but maybe not too wide. <laughs> But once we've uh, collected everyone's insights and ideas from their own brains and, you know, it's not a shouting match here, that's not the way to do it, but you're going to have a, a wealth of raw material mm. um, by the afternoon because now hitting the afternoon, we're going to start sketching, uh, sketching our ideas and this is where you've got no debating again, no, no shouting over each other, no deferring judgment and you're actually letting the wacky ideas flourish. So, I just spoke about poor old Johnny, but if you've got Johnny there putting out a flop, you probably want to be lifting Johnny up and embracing <laughs> the people like that so everyone's comfortable to get outside their comfort zone. Yeah, you might have, you know, nine times out of 10, it was probably a shit idea, but there's a, every one out of 10, it might be something revolutionary that they come up with. So let them run with it for sure. But the, the point here of this sketch is uh, that focused alone time. It's not the group brainstorming. Everyone's taking all the raw materials that they've heard throughout the week so far and coming up with their own idea of how you could solve this problem. And the the other great equalizer here, everyone gets a bit of pen and paper. So it's no there's no design software. You can't just have the, the graphics person dominate because it looks the best. It's purely on the idea itself. Everyone can just draw little boxes and lines and put words on it. So it's really, you're boiling it down to just the core of the idea, not like the presentation. So you're not biased in that way. I like it, mate. So Monday, we're, we're working out what our overarching goal is. Tuesday, we're putting a, a wide range of solutions on, on the table that we can potentially go down. If you're thinking about um, Decisive, which we, we did by uh, Dan, Dan Chip and, and Dan. Chip and Dan, it's pretty much it, right? Up until this point, they're following the same um, <laughs> yeah. sort of pathway to end up to a solution. So as you'd guess, by Wednesday, right now, we've got a stack of solutions. But now there's the problem of actually what are we going to decide to do and what's going to be the best one we're going to going to go with for the prototyping phase that's right if you've got six or seven people in your sprint there's probably six or seven really good ideas the problem is you can't do them all you got to pick one and it can be tough um, but it's important to pick that one to focus on and there's a good story here to illustrate you know how you can come to this decision there's a company that started out with a video game called glitch 
Now, Glitch, it was, this, it was a multiplayer game, but it was unlike most multiplayer games because normally you're just fighting people. Glitch was all about collaboration, solving problems, working as a team, having a chat where everyone works together to solve a problem. Not surprisingly, it was a pretty lame sort of a game. <laughs> it didn't catch mm. on. Glitch quickly died. But something good did come out of Glitch was that sort of chat functionality uh, and the collaboration element that they thought, oh, maybe there's something here we can ditch Glitch, but maybe something in this messaging system could be used for something else. So they were using this team communication systems for whilst they were building the game, the one that was in the game. So they were using it for themselves as a company, not thinking there's that much value in that, but they personally were getting a lot of value in running the company that way. So they thought, hey, can we rinse and repeat this to other companies? And they launched it and it went public and of course it went bonkers. Today it's called Slack. And within a year of launch, 500,000 people from more than 60,000 teams were using Slack every single day. Yeah, that's pretty unheard of for business software. And Slack became one of the fastest growing business apps of all time and obviously kept growing still. And I feel like it's still growing. Um, Some people are still finding out Slack for the first time and seem to be amazed by it. Now, Slack, as we said, just said, was the biggest, fastest growing business app of all time. Jake, the author, he's claiming a little bit of credit here, (laughs) even though... He didn't really have a lot to uh, to do with Slack. He did run a sprint for Slack. And so he's saying that it was probably... Jake get equity out of that? <laughs> I don't think he'd so. He'd be spewing if he didn't. He probably just got paid his, you know, his one-week consulting 2000, fee. 2000 and bucks. And, yeah. <laughs> and moved on. But what he said was, okay, they had a whole bunch of different great ideas as to how they could communicate Slack to other people, but it was through the sprint process that they came to the right one. So the biggest challenge that Slack had... It made sense to like the techie types of people that were initially using Slack, but when it came to like communicating how to use Slack for non-techie people in the company, it was a bit confusing to use. Like there's there's different chats, there's different threads, there's different things you can do. There's uh, they're like, how do we explain this thing to somebody? Once they use it, it's fantastic, mm-hmm. and once they get the hang of it, it works awesome. But how do we get them, you know, from the point of not knowing what's going on to just a simple communication of here's how you do it? Yeah, it would have been a worthwhile sprint for them and I'd imagine like anyone who's doing a sprint or say the conventional process of getting ideas from the team and then choosing which one to go with, a lot of the time you can have allegiances with the company and you can have the boss who's got their favorites and uh, it's probably going to be difficult to choose what the objectively best idea is. So, at this day, we want to be objectively choosing the best idea and not actually have to worry about you know, who do you like more and personal yeah. <laughs> affiliations and so forth. That's right. So on Tuesday, everyone did their own sketch. You keep it anonymous. They should all look pretty similar because you're just sketching boxes and lines and words on, on paper. So on Wednesday, you now have a, a bit of an art museum. You, you pin up around the room on the walls all the different sketches from the Tuesday afternoon and then everybody walks around takes their time to quietly and privately look at all these things, take in little bits and pieces, trying to work out which one they think is probably the best idea. Most people are probably going to think it's their own, but you've got to try to break outside of, of that as, and look at other people's as well. That's why you get given a little pink sticky dot <laughs> and right. uh, you put it on, the, on all the sketches or even a part of a single sketch, the parts that you like. And then after a while, you're going to have a shitloads of dots everywhere and you can have a heat map um, which is going to give you good objective indication about hey what direction we should be doing and which is the best prototype. Yeah, that's right. You're gonna you know some bits you might like the the top of one and then the middle of another and then the bottom of one other and you end up going around the room and see that all these these dots start to form in the bits that everybody kind of agrees that these are the best things. And once you start seeing these dots all come together, it starts to paint a nice sort of picture of what could be the best idea here that we can take and mix and match and combine and create one awesome idea. And from here, our decider and facilitator is going to make the call on which one we're going to go with. You know, And like every day, there's a few more activities to, to get there in between. But at the end of the day, it's the decider making the call here. Thursday, we're waking up. We're heading to work. We're grabbing a coffee. And at this stage... It, we're not going to prototype today. That's There's a lot of shit to get done, right, in, in a single bloody day. The person who at the start of the week, the probably like the development person who was like, how can you possibly expect me to build a whole thing in five days that's ready to use? Yeah, mate, All of a sudden, he's on day four and we haven't even started. <laughs> and he's like, what the fuck? Mate, I reckon they're rolling in at 4 a.m. today and going home at 4 a.m. that evening. That's probably the, in, this, in the um, asterisk of the book, right? 
Mate, the book says it's a 10 to 4 operation with with an hour for lunch in between. I don't know. The software engine, <laughs> if it is a software, the software engine has been pretty quiet the first three days. Their ideas have probably sucked. Everyone smiled and nodded because they're, you know, they're in Ocean's Eleven, they're just like the um, the gymnasts trying to strategize with George Clooney, just coming up with shitty ideas. Now you've got the gymnasts jumping into the little thing and, and trying to do all this, the hardest stuff and the most critical stuff, right? That's right. That's right. Um, the good thing about our one-day prototype is that we're not building the full thing. It just needs to be enough. We need to be able to fake it. We're not building the full-scale solution. We're just building a facade so that it looks good enough to be believable and can be tested. As a metaphor, like if you watch an old Western movie, it looks very realistic, but you're really being fooled because all they're doing is putting up a literal facade on top mm. of these buildings and putting the boardwalks inside the buildings. It's just your normal neighborhood, which is a bit more <laughs> modern than that. But you're fooled being the, the viewer and being the customer in this case. Yeah, that's right. The old spaghetti westerns, it turned out they just filmed in the street of a small Italian town because it looked like an awesome old western street. But then all the actual bits of like filming inside bars and stuff were somewhere else. Uh, but that's kind of what we're doing here is we're just putting up the facade. Like we're creating a bit of an illusion. Here's how our product could look. Here's how the main features could operate. And we're going to build it all in one day. So the principles here is we need to, to have a prototype mindset and understand uh, the limitations of what we might be building. So facade's one thing, but we got to believe and understand the prototypes are disposable and don't prototype anything that you're not willing to throw away. Yeah, with this prototype, we've got to build just enough to learn but not more because we've only got a day to do it. The prototypes have to appear real. They can't look too shitty. You need to get that Goldilocks zone, too shit and it's not going to work, too good and you take too much time. You get to, need to get to the right middle ground where you're not wasting effort but you're achieving that minimum requirement. Yeah, so if, you know, for example, I think it might have came up in Lean Startup. But let's say if you're trying to build an AI chatbot system, it's going to take a lot of money to build a whole AI chatbot system. Instead, you might actually for your first customers just have actually a human there mm. behind it. But so you know, as a facade, you're saying it's AI, but it's actually a real human. It's probably going to cost a lot more resources in the short term, but that's okay in this case. Yeah, and that's what ended up with uh, Slack that Jake's claiming a lot of credit for. <laughs> that in Slack was they want to have all these bots to explain, here's how you do this different feature and the bot would explain it all and then you can ask the bot, how do I do this? And the bot would reply back. It takes a lot of bloody work. That's like, mm. uh, that's like months of work probably to build these bots to be that intuitive. But at first, they literally just had a dude behind a curtain typing like the, the Wizard of Oz, just the guy behind the curtain was operating it all, which was a much easier way of doing it. And something that you can't, like you don't even need to do it at all. Like you yeah. just need a fake profile as acting as the bot and there's your prototype built. Yeah, I like this. I'm going to shoot from the here, Ash show. Feel free to knock me down. But <laughs> let's say if you're trying to write a book, probably not a good sprint one. You probably want to go a bit more <laughs> audacious and ambitious than writing a book for something like a sprint, having so many people in the room. But just as an example, you know, this day for a prototype, if you're choosing what book to write out of all your different ideas, maybe you just um, put a cover together, go on uh, mm. Fiverr or go on a, uh, what's the one we use, 99 Designs originally, mm. we, did, we ended up going, <laughs> not using any of that, but... It was a good prototype. But you yeah. might do that and then you you actually do your, uh, your, on your next day, you do your Facebook ads to target you know, 30 different book titles and different ideas and then you find out which one. Yeah, I don't mind it, mate. That's not a bad idea for a sprint. Maybe for the next book, we should do a sprint on well, it first. Well, in general, I think um, the principles probably could be applied to anything. Yeah. But the processes behind this yeah. are, don't have Pretty to be niche. so rigid, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, like have, totally. You don't need 11 people in the room. You could probably do this personally over six weeks, I think. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, totally. Um Except you're kind of violating that rule of the one week sprint, but that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. You can take, you can, you can mix and match. I think that's what most people are doing anyway. They're claiming that it's a sprint, but it's it's very different from the Google Sprint. Uh, but that so that was day four. Thursday was building that prototype. Friday, final day of the sprint. It's time to test this puppy out. So here we need to test it with customers and doing it through an interview process. So one person on your team is the interviewer who sits with a customer um, and guides them through the prototype while the rest of the people are just like in the um, interrogation room behind that, <laughs> behind the glass, just looking in and what's going to happen <laughs> What's going to happen, and judging all the facial reactions. And uh, they're going on a bit of an emotional roller coaster, right? Yeah. Sometimes they'll see 
something they thought was awesomely intuitive and so clean and simple, then the customer just gets confused. They don't know what to click. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. Um, you know, if they get confused, you're going to be frustrated. If they don't care about the idea, you're going to be disappointed. If they complete a difficult task though and they achieve something, you're like, oh, great, it's actually working. So there's going to be a real roller coaster going on here. The more interviews you get, the better data you're going to get. Um, and you're probably going to have, you know, a heat map also of, of where most of the issues and the bugs are in this prototype you've built, but also probably where most of your successes are and things that you can actually build upon later. Yeah, interestingly though, that um, one guy, Jakob Nielsen, he kind of pioneered the field of this web usability. He found that actually the first five people to test something find 85% of the problems. And then after that, it's a real, a real quick drop off, uh, a real long tail where it probably takes 100 people to find that next 5% and you're never really going to get to 100%. But he's, he's found that, so instead of like testing 10 people, just test five, you're going to find 85% of the problems, fix those and then get another five and you'll find the next 85% of the problems. So it's a, you don't need, you need a, a handful, but you don't need too many. Five is a good number. So it's a lot of fun, mate. So by the day five, you're, you're knocking off work and you've done a lot this week. And today it's felt like a long mystery because you've collected clues throughout the day in the background you've had people taking notes and trying to understand what the customer's reaction is as much as possible it's probably something intuitively i don't think we give enough time to is actually this interview process and understand what they're thinking because at the end of the day they're the ones going to be buying you mm. putting their hard earned across the table to, uh, <laughs> to buy your product yeah exactly but the the good news is that there's a winner every time about a sprint if you do a sprint you can't lose coming from the guy who created the sprint makes sense he would say that you can't lose but the good thing is like you get to test a real prototype with real customers uh you're going to learn in just five days basically he says you're going to go through the the hard part of testing and learning without going through the hard part of you know spending weeks or months and and you know tens of thousands of dollars building stuff uh sometimes you're going to have a win in the sense of it works really well sometimes you're going to have a win in the sense of it didn't work so well so maybe you got to pick a different path. So uh, whatever happens at the end of the sprint, it's always going to be a good outcome. I'll let you roll through the days as the recap, mate, but really what we've done then, we've sprinted through the sprint yeah. in a sense. <laughs> we have. I think the five general principles are really a great framework and mm. this is this book's a lot about like the activities which fall under those principles and, and fitting it all into a week. But I think... That's where, probably where I learned the most is just, hey, these are five different ways you, you need to go about building a prototype and a startup and I've probably got a bias at neglecting some areas but you know through this process, you can't neglect certain areas and you're giving it time uh, where it's meant to be. Yeah, I think this book is literally an, uh, uh, an all-in-one. If you want to run a sprint, read this book and follow it step by step and it's, it covers pretty much everything you need to know. But at the same time, whilst you've got your very specifically regimented, tactical, step-by-step, five-day sprint, and if you're doing that, this book's perfect for it, there's also a whole bunch of meta lessons that uh, kind of came along for the ride here that uh, you can take and apply to any situation, whether or not you're doing an actual five-day, everybody in the same room in the same place sprint or not. Firstly, instead of jumping right into solutions, take your time to map out the problem and agree on the initial target. You're going to be probably like a a, a bull in a in a bull, you know, a bull in a bull rider's <laughs> pen where um they, they open the thing with the, the red blanket and you just want to fire off the red blanket. You want to hang out for a little bit. So, you know, start slow at the very beginning. And then because of that, you can go fast later. Yeah, that's a, that's a good meta capper. Another one is that instead of just shouting out ideas in group brainstorming, you can work independently to make you know more detailed, more fleshed out ideas. So sometimes group brainstorming, it's a bit broken. Sometimes that independent thought is, is what gets you over the line. Instead of abstract debate and endless meetings, use voting in that uh, sticky note system or the sticky dot system and the decider and that way you're going to make crisp decisions that reflect your team's principles and with that you get the best of both worlds the wisdom of crowds but without the downside of groupthink also instead of getting all the details right uh, and trying to have something perfect before you test it just go for the facade approach go for the prototype mindset where you can build things quickly test things quickly and learn quickly mm-hmm.